Hello and welcome to Talking Points. I'm Dave Kelly, Director of Advanced Media Production at Cal State Long Beach. Today we're going to talk about drought and freshwater issues around the globe. My guest today is Dr. Laura Stevens Landon. Dr. Landon is an Associate Professor of Geological Sciences. Welcome, Laura, and thank you for joining us on Talking Points. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for having me. Well, here in California, we've been hearing about drought for several years now, more times than, than we can count in terms of how many times we've heard it on the television newscasts. But maybe we should start with some basics. What exactly is the definition of a drought, and why are we in a drought? Well, drought means different things to different people. Um, a farmer might view a drought as insufficient moisture for their crops to grow, whereas a meteorologist would consider a drought to be a very prolonged period of time of abnormally dry weather that causes hydrologic imbalance. Now, those might seem like splitting hairs, but it actually is very important in how we regulate freshwater sources and how we address concerns to various stakeholders. I think for this particular talk, we can use a very simplistic version of drought, which is it's a period of below normal precipitation. That can be either rain or snow. And so then the question becomes, what is normal? And so meteorologists use a average value for 30 years to determine what is normal. Now as a geologist, I'm always looking much further into the past. So I reconstruct drought, droughts over thousands of years. And then my perspective on what constitutes a drought is a little bit different. And so we're in a drought now because for the last five years, we've had well below average precipitation compared to this 30-year period that we use. And for the Los Angeles area, which is where we're taping this show, it's around 13, 14 inches a year annually in terms of rainfall or precipitation that we should be receiving. But we've only been getting about maybe five or six inches at best. Yeah, so half of that. that that's a drought. But a drought can apply to even very wet climates as well, as you were mentioning, because uh, if we look at the city of Atlanta, for example, I think they get almost 50 inches of rain a year. So if you're in Atlanta and you only get 35 inches when you're supposed to get 50, that would still be considered a drought. Absolutely. Anywhere, even the tropical monsoon regions can have droughts. It's just precipitation below what that region considers normal. But how Atlanta might view a drought and how they might respond to a drought, given that they have more moisture than we have, is a little bit different than we would here in a semi-arid climate. And so let's talk about the fact that California is also a dry climate, generally speaking. So what is the difference from a practical standpoint of living in a drought cycle or just living in a dry, arid or semi-arid climate? That's more an, an issue of degrees. It's, it's really amount of time. A, Dry climate is just a climate that has low precipitation for hundreds or thousands of years. Now, if you look in the past, dr places that have dry climates now could have had wet climates, you know, 10,000 years ago and vice versa. Meteorologists tend to put very strict definitions to, to climates. So a desert, for example, has less than 10 inches of moisture every year. Semi-arid regions are 10 to 20. So we are here in LA, smack dab in the middle of, of a semi-arid region. And if you want to think about the practical points of, of dry versus drought, you just look at the natural vegetation. So our natural vegetation in Southern California is well adapted to the low amounts of precipitation we get. But we can still kill that vegetation if we have a prolonged drought. But here in LA, we tend to have a lot of non-natural vegetation. So the example that always comes to mind is maples. Maples need about 25 to 50 inches of moisture every year, which is well beyond what we have here in LA. So in order to keep a maple alive in Los Angeles, we have to put more water. And in California, we refer to this as a quote unquote Mediterranean climate. And I guess that means it rains in the winter and is dry in the summer, that's as it is in the Mediterranean. That's exactly what it means. And, but, but really, what we have is about half of California being essentially a desert, the eastern half, of course, the inland side, particularly in the southeastern part of the state. And Mark Reisner, an author in 1986, wrote a book called The Cadillac Desert about California. What was he talking about when he referred to the Cadillac Desert? When I think of Cadillac, I think that's synonymous with wealth 
and luxury. And I think what Reisner was getting at in his seminal work was that we've built this luxurious green oasis in the middle of a desert. But to keep it green and to keep it as beautiful as it is, it's expensive. And there's costs both economic and monetary, but there's also cost in societal structure and in uh, environmental impacts. And so when we talk about this Cadillac Desert, that implies that we've made something that shouldn't have been here in the first place, but it's attractive because of that quote unquote Mediterranean climate and also the fact that yeah. uh, the ocean and the topography and everything is so beautiful here. So are we exacerbating our drought by trying to encourage people to move to the Sun Belt, particularly the Southwest? The short answer to that one is yes. So I got my PhD in the Midwest and I remember going to meetings and the Californians were always, oh, it's so too bad that you're in such a cold climate. And uh, it was beautiful in December, I was out surfing. And we brag about it in, in California and that encourages people to move here. But the more people that move here, the greater the stress on our fresh water sources. And we're having to bring water in from outside just to maintain the population and this beautiful green oasis that we've created. And as, as the drought continues, we hear more and more people talking about, well, what about desalination or desalinization? You hear both terms and they mean the same thing. And that's where we take ocean water and we extract the salt water or the salt out of the water so that we can then have water without salt or i.e. fresh water. <laughs> kind of a long explanation there, but in any event, uh, what are the pros and cons of desalination? The pros are that it's an old technique and it's been used worldwide. I think there's about 120 countries that use desalinization to produce fresh water. They're usually in dry climates like our own, but the amount that they produce is typically very small. The cons are that desalinization plants interact with our coastal system. So the intake pipes may pull in organisms or eggs, and that will have an impact on, say, our commercial fisheries. Then when we take the water, for every two gallons that we, of salt water we pull in, we get one gallon of fresh water, and then we get one gallon of really hyper, hyper salty water. And that salt has to be put somewhere. And most often we put it back into the ocean. On a small scale, that's probably okay. But if we have a really large scale operation, we could change the chemistry of the ocean and again, impact the ecosystem. So it's kind of a gamble. I mean, we could have this uh, new source of fresh water or we could destroy the coastline, which is one of the things that makes California so, so beautiful and so great to live at. So like with every solution, you have to balance the ecological impact with what the perceived good would be in this case. Optimally, you, you do. And I know that people think of some ecological impacts as being um, kind of not necessary or you, you hear the delta smelt, but there's a, there's a cascade effect that happens. If you affect any part of the ecosystem, the other parts of the ecosystem will be affected. And I think people have to remember in Southern California, we do have commercial fisheries. We do rely on the ocean for some of our food. There's another solution and that's cloud seeding. And they use this quite a bit in the winter time, which is uh, the season we're in at the moment. And uh, cloud seeding in California involves dropping silver iodide into uh, clouds that are uh, ready to snow so that you can generate more snow. How does that actually work? So I'm not an expert on cloud seeding, but what I do know from what I've read of, from experts is that um, when you have a cloud and you've got water vapor in the air, sometimes the water vapor won't clump together and make a heavy enough drop of rain to fall to the ground. So then it's just water vapor in the air. When you seed a cloud, you create a nucleation site where the water can attach to this nucleation site and become heavy enough to actually fall to the ground. They use silver iodide because it has a similar structure to ice. And so it's a natural seed or nucleation point. But what you said is that, and this is the important part, is that you have to have clouds to begin with to, to create this rainfall. They just used this recently in Los Angeles during a storm to increase the rainfall. 
To get rain, you have to have moist air and it has to rise. Our current drought system, we're under a high pressure zone. So that is, that is air from coming up way high and pushing down. And that creates clear, beautiful blue skies, no rain clouds. So no amount of seeding will produce rain in that situation. You have to have the clouds first. So the clouds have to be there to begin with. Uh, mm -hmm. The best estimates that they've offered is that you can increase the amount of precipitation by 10%, maybe 15% at best. Yeah, so then you're, you're boosting what falls to the ground and that's only useful if you have a way to store it. So otherwise it's just gonna roll into the ocean and you've just wasted that opportunity. So if you can store that extra water and bank it for the future, then it's a good option. Okay, well let's move on to other parts of the country because California um, has a drought on the West Coast. Much of the West Coast has experienced a bit of a drought over the last several years. But you have a graphic that you've brought in that explains what I'm going to call a tale of two uh, weather systems. And <laughs> what are those two weather systems that our viewers are looking at right now? Okay, so you can see on the western half of the country, it's very warm, and there's a big H, which stands for high pressure. And then on the eastern side of the country, it's very cold, and there's a big L, which stands for low pressure. For the last five years, we've been under what is referred to by, um, it's been dubbed this, the ridiculously resilient ridge. So a ridge is just a very long high pressure system, and it steers the movement of air. So in a high pressure system, like I said, air is coming down and that blocks the moist air from the Pacific coming in. And instead of coming into California, it turns and goes northward up into Canada, wraps around the top of that ridge and flows southward into the eastern US. Now when it does that, it's now cold. So why is there precipitation? You get precipitation anytime you take moist air and cool it down. So that cold air is meeting this moist air coming up from the Gulf or from the Caribbean, and you're getting these narrow belts of very intense rainfall in the east and nothing in the west. And in January, we've seen uh, the cold weather pulled down via the polar vortex, and we just have a moment left before we go to the break. What about that polar vortex? The polar vortex is related to these high and low pressure zones, and it steers this purple line that you're seeing, which is the jet stream, and storms follow the jet stream. So where the jet stream is, that's where you're going to have your precipitation. And on that note, we're going to have to go to the break right now. When we come back, we'll talk more about weather systems and uh, freshwater issues around the globe. Stay with us. Make a difference in our future by researching and helping to preserve our natural resources. The wide variety of careers in this field will have a huge impact on our lives while using the principles of engineering, chemistry, and biology to help find solutions to environmental problems. You could be a part of this exciting field with a degree from Cal State Long Beach. Welcome back to Talking Points. I'm Dave Kelly and my guest today is Dr. Laura Stevens Landon. And Laura, before we went to the break, we were talking about the climate in the United States and how we've seen some changes and high pressure ridges and the polar vortex and all of those sorts of things. But the climate uh, obviously is much larger than just the United States. It covers the entire world. And we know that uh, fresh water is an issue around the planet. We have what's called the hydrological cycle where you have water which evaporates and then it precipitates back down to the earth. And there's this cycle that sort of stays in balance. Say a few words, if you will, about the hydrological cycle and why it is that today, because of our expanding population around the world, we're talking about running out of, quote unquote, fresh water. Okay, so think of the hydrologic cycle um, as a series of boxes. And the atmosphere is a box, the ocean is a box, uh, rivers and lakes are a box, and underneath the ground there's a vast store of water, and that's also a box. Now the hydrologic cycle is in balance because we only have so much water on the face of the earth. But the reservoirs, or these boxes, can change sizes. So we can increase the size of the atmosphere box, but decrease the size of the ocean box. And the rates at which we move water between those boxes is what's really important. Now, if you look 
deep in the past, like I do as a geologist, 20,000 years ago, uh, when mastodons and saber-toothed tigers were roaming the earth, um, the hydrologic cycle looked a little bit different than it does today. The global temperature, temperature was colder, and so the air was drier, there was less precipitation, but we had this enormous box of fresh water in the ice in Canada. If you go back 65 million years ago, that box of ice doesn't exist at all. So these boxes increase and decrease in size. Now when you talk about humans and the increase in population, what we're doing is we're accelerating the transfer of water from the freshwater boxes, that's surface water and groundwater, and we're moving them to the ocean, more or less. So when we talk about running out of water, what we're really talking about is we're taking water out of one of these boxes faster than it's going back into the box. So that's particularly true for groundwater. We're pumping it out faster than it's being replenished, which takes thousands of years. So if you think about it in terms of your bank account, groundwater is your inheritance and we're spending it at a very rapid rate. So we're running out of fresh water for this expanding population. And if we talk about other ways in which mankind has uh, intruded on the environment, we're cutting down the Amazon rainforest and other forests in order to, I guess, uh, develop more agriculture or, or have more grazing and that kind of thing. Um, but when you cut down a rainforest, there's a lot of humidity and a lot of rain that occurs in that rainforest. What happens when we decimate the Amazon forest? That's kind of an ongoing experiment, and we don't really know. There's a lot of models out there, and we're getting more and more data. But rainforests are very good at taking water out of the ground and putting it into the atmosphere. And in fact, rainforests can feed themselves. They take the water through a process of evapotranspiration, put it into the atmosphere, it goes over another part of the rainforest and rains out. Um, when you cut down the rainforest, you kind of short circuit that cycle. And one study has estimated that the reduction in transfer is about 4%. Now that doesn't seem like a lot, but at a regional scale, it can really affect those various boxes in a rainforest. Another study is really focused on if you cut down the rainforest vegetation itself, you can run into a drying effect, and that can actually impact big rain systems like the monsoons. Right, if we talk about economic development, which is what's happening when you tear down a rainforest, but we have economic development going on in much of the world today. We know that in India, we have somewhere between 200 to 300 million uh, people that are considered middle class. And of course, we have the United States and, and China, which is fast growing, uh, will have about 630 million people in their middle class by the year 2022, which is not that far away. So what happens when you have people moving up the economic scale in terms of the use of fresh water? When you have more discretionary income, you can buy things that you ordinarily wouldn't buy. And so people that are wealthier can eat better food and they can eat what we might consider luxury food. So take uh, meat, for example, they can consume meat and there's different estimates, but it takes some couple hundred to 500 gallons of water to produce one hamburger. So that's a lot of water. So a family of six eats, if they eat hamburgers, they've eaten enough water to fill a backyard swimming pool. Then you take, that's, but meat has nutrition, okay? Now you take something like wine, all right? Wine grapes are very water intensive and wine is delicious and people like it, but it has no nutritional value. So as people become wealthier and they want these kind of luxury food items, they're willing to accept that we're going to take some of our precious fresh water and we're gonna move it from growing crops with nutritional value to growing crops without nutritional value. And that's an important distinction and an important choice that people are making. Well, let's talk about world population in general. Okay and how the population has expanded. In 1959, there were approximately three billion people roaming the planet. And a mere 40 years later in 1999, that population number had doubled to six billion. And estimates are at the current rate of growth, if we go another almost 40 years to 2038, there will be 
nine billion people. So if we're talking about an 80 year stretch of time, we have tripled the population. What does that mean in terms of the planet's carrying capacity and its impact on fresh water? So this idea of carrying capacity is an ecological concept and the carrying capacity of a region is the number of organisms, say humans, that can live there based on how much water there is, food there is, and other resources. So if we just kind of focus in again on Los Angeles, right now LA, the greater LA basin has about 18 million people. And when Mark Reisner was researching his book, it was 11 million, yeah, 11 million people. And even then we had to bring water in from another source because we have well exceeded the carrying capacity of the LA Basin. We actually, you, we bring in about 80% of the water that we need. So the carrying capacity for the LA Basin is somewhere between about two to three million people. That's how far past we are here. And to do that, we have to tap these inheritance reservoirs, these groundwater reservoirs. And that's happening everywhere around the world, including places like India and China. Well, what that means is that science now has to intervene in agriculture in order to be able to feed this growing population. And so we're now looking at a situation where science has to create plants that are hardier, that are more resistant to drought, that involve uh, genetic modification, and a lot of folks are not happy with the GMO movement <laughs> in general. So what about that? Are we increasingly relying on science to bail us out? Probably. I think, I think the natural instinct of people is to try to engineer their way out of a crisis. And I think we need to be very careful about trying to do that because every time we make an engineered solution, we can introduce a new problem. So, for example, to uh, use a hydrologic example, we want clean energy. So we build hydroelectric dams. Now, in the Northwest, salmon can't spawn up the rivers to complete their cycle and we're decimating the salmon fishery. So we shoot salmon and cannons over the dams so that they can spawn. I think we have to be very, very careful about trying to outsmart mother nature. And I think we have to be very careful about trying to accelerate natural processes because time and time and time again, we come up with a solution to a problem and then it has unintended consequences. What about the idea of organic living? That's very popular here in the Cadillac Desert in California and other <laughs> places. But is organic living really something that's practical for most of the world? And if not, is organic living really a luxury for most of the world? I think a lot of the world still does organic living as we think about it, but more and more, especially in India and China, as their populations expand, they need things like pesticides and herbicides to, and fertilizers to keep their crop yields high enough. For us in California, it's a luxury lifestyle. I mean, we can afford it. And when you grow things organically, you use less chemicals, but you also have smaller yields. The vast majority of the world isn't interested in better food or more luxurious food. They just want enough food. And that requires these fertilizers and pesticides. What are we going to have to do in the future if we're going to be able to manage our population without hitting um, the upper limits of the carrying capacity? What are some of the decision points we're going to have to make? Well, I don't know about the decision points for how we're going to manage our, our caring capacity of people. But I think we can, as individual, make personal choices. And I think, as a society, we need a paradigm shift. In the 1970s, litter was a huge problem. Um, and there was this enormous campaign, societally, to, to reduce litter. And we need something like that with our freshwater resources here in the US. Um, if you think about it, we bring in water and, and everybody has a choice in using that water. And some people are, are saying, I value this water, so I'm going to treat it like a precious commodity. And some people are saying, I don't value this water and I'm not going to treat it like a precious commodity. And if you have those two groups of people side by side, that creates societal stress. There have been many droughts in the past. Um, this is what I study. 
And there have been many different civilizations that have basically failed because of drought. And in every circumstance, it's not that the people died, they migrated, it's that the society collapsed. And if we want our society here in the US and we want the civilization that we've established in California to continue, then we have to make personal choices and we have to be mindful that our choices have impacts on other people. If people are watering their cars, or sorry, watering their cars, if they're washing their cars in their driveway, and I saw many people doing this last summer, and I spoke to some of them, and I said, is that a good use of water? And they're like, I know, I know it's a drought. But what they're saying is, I don't care. But I think they'd care if they treated water like we treat gasoline. Would you take a gallon of, would you take gallons of gasoline and pour it over your car to make it shiny? I doubt that. But yet people are willing to do that to water. We don't need gasoline to live. We need water to live physiologically and for our food. It is our most precious resource. We just have a few seconds left, so in the 30 seconds or so <laughs> that we've got available, uh, as we talk about the future, is water always going to be a primary issue of discussion? With an expanding population, yes. It's going to be always at the forefront of all the news. And with that note, we're going to have to uh, say goodbye, but it's been very interesting to hear uh, about the past, the present, and the future. Thanks. And thank you for joining us on this edition of Talking Points. Join us again soon for another episode. Until then, I'm Dave Kelly. Have a nice day. <laughs>